So it is uh, my great pleasure to introduce this uh, thesis colloquium by Charles Law. And I especially want to welcome Charles's family, who I know is joining us uh, online. So thank you so much for calling into this. And of course, thank you everyone else uh, who is joining us, both here in the room uh, and via uh, YouTube. So Charles did his uh, undergraduate uh, here at Harvard, and that's how I first met him, as uh, during senior trip. Uh, and uh, I convinced him to do his senior thesis with me, which I was uh, ended up being very, very happy about. Uh, so when uh, Charles then joined us um, in the PhD program, which he did bringing four first office papers with him into the program, I um, did my best to try to recruit him into the astrochemistry in this group. Now, I had some tough competition in doing that, which is why there are indeed two advisors <laughs> on, on the screen. So, Chichu and I have been co-advising Charles during the past five years, uh, me on the disk side, and of course, Chichu on the massive star formation uh, side. Um, so, Charles not being able to choose between these two topics uh, now ended up doing a, a thesis uh, on both. As uh, Charles was joining, we had just gotten approved this large program with ALMA called MAPS. And I couldn't think of any student that would be sort of better suited to take the lead in analyzing this data than, than Charles. And indeed, that's what Charles ended up doing. Now, this is a large program, so a lot of opinionated people from all over the place. So in addition to learning how to deal with sort of how to get science out of this sort of large data set, I think it was also for both of us a steep learning curve in how to deal in with how to get science out of a large group uh, that were people coming from many different places. And I think it's um, fair to say that there's no way that the maps would have been, I think, a really beautiful collaboration that was without Charles at the center, both sort of scientifically but also as sort of the first citizen, always helping out, always making sure that everyone was on board uh, with different things. And you will hear talks that's full of like really, really great science that I'm really proud uh, to be part of, and that many of it grew out of sort of the MAPS experience. Uh, but I think the other thing that I really want to highlight is just uh, what a great sort of student citizen that Charles has been, both within the, the disk and astrochemistry group, but also larger within the department and just how much I appreciate all sort of the extra work that you have done in helping others and just enabling the science, scientific, you know, sort of personal growth of other people in the program as well as with the, the undergraduates. That, that's just something that we will really miss <laughs> uh, in addition to your many sort of scientific uh, insights. Because if this uh, happens to go well, uh, then... <laughs> Then Charles uh, will be taking a Hubble Fellowship uh, to University of Virginia in the fall to work with uh, work with all the kids. Uh, but with that, I don't want to take up any more of the time. So Charles, please take it away. All right, well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Karen. And I'm really happy to be presenting my thesis to everyone today. Thanks for sticking through this, the fifth thesis of this week, uh, <laughs> second of the day. Uh, and so my, my thesis is titled Zooming In on the Chemistry of Star and Planet Formation. And it really is that first two words that is going to set the central theme for what I'm going to show, what we can really do with high spatial resolution, all the complexity that we can reveal and all the interesting science we can achieve. But, oh, okay. So I just want to start first with acknowledgments. And, and really, I won't be able to do this any sort of justice. This is very much non-exhaustive. Having been here for over 10 years now, I've met so many wonderful people that I, I cannot thank enough for this wonderful environment. But I do want to start thanking my advisors, Ed Shizu and, and Karin, who have been absolutely fantastic. I cannot convey the depth of gratitude that I have to the, the two of you for really seeing me through this process. Constant personal, professional encouragement has just been a fantastic time. And as Karin has said, I've met both of you actually during my undergrad time here. Karin on the trip as when I was a senior, and then Chizu as part of uh, AY191 um, with the SMA. So I guess the SMA is the unifying reason why we've, we've met. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Chizu, for having me in my post-grad year when I didn't have anywhere to go, applying to grad schools again. Thanks for, for giving me a place to, to be uh, and letting me be here today. Thanks to Karin for giving me an opportunity to be part of MAPS and really for trusting me to, to take the, the role that I had, despite the fact that that was my first disk chemistry project. So I really appreciate that. 
I want to thank my entire committee, uh, Dimitar, David, and Meredith. Um, they been, David and Dimitar have been there the whole way. All the different TAC meetings, all the personal, professional encouragement that you've provided. I just want to thank you so much. I want to thank Meredith for being at my external committee, for traveling here, agreeing to read the thesis. I understand the time and effort this takes. I really appreciate all the expertise you, you bring. And I want to thank the entire Oberg group, uh, past and present. I've been here for, for a while, so I've seen a few generations of people. And everybody is fantastic. I've had such a wonderful time in this friendly, great environment. Personally, it's been wonderful. Research-wise, it's been excellent. I'm, I'm grateful, and it's been a privilege to work with all of you. And I want to thank the CFA more broadly, so all of the acronyms, SSP, RNG, SMA, SAO, CF, all the scientists and staff that I've had a chance to uh, interact with. Only a small subset are here shown in the pictures. Specifically, I want to thank the wider Planet Formation group. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, thank you, Rich. Um, they've really, really been helpful in shaping me as a scientist and this thesis. And I want to, of course, thank Peg and Christine. So really, without Peg, None of this would happen. I wouldn't be here today. The department wouldn't run. Her tireless efforts really have improved all of our lives, not just mine. So thank you so much, Peg, for all that you do for us. I want to thank Christine as well for helping with all the logistics, funding, travel, everything. I would never have been able to make it to a conference without Christine. <laughs> so thank you so much. OK, and just also want to thank all my collaborators. The work I'm going to be showing really is the product of many people. It's not just me. Really, the hard work of all of these people uh, is, is making this, this work possible. And specifically, a thanks to the MAPS team, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later. But this is an absolutely fantastic group of people that I've had the privilege of getting to know um, through MAPS. And so making this, I was painfully aware of how I don't take a lot of pictures. So I'm just sticking everything all together. It looks like a lot of pictures, but it's actually not. Um, I just want to thank first the graduate student community here. I've had uh, a wonderful time. I've had formed lots of great friendships. And it is just the best place you could ever uh, ask to do a PhD. So thank you all. Uh, everybody that's watching, thank, thank you so much. I want to uh, thank my partner, Cindy, for all her unconditional support throughout this process. It really wouldn't have been possible without her. And of course, I want to thank my parents. Um, of course, support through the PhD, but throughout my whole life. I really wouldn't be able to be here without their, their support. Um, and thank, thank you so much. So, All right, so time to, to, to get started. Um, so I like this. Uh, artistic rendition of exoplanets all piled together. And so we live in a somewhat privileged time where we have now 5,000 confirmed exoplanets. And what I like about this image is it shows the relative diversity uh, of those exoplanets. We see planets uh, around stars at different separations, planets with different masses, radius, density, compositions, and so forth. And so what's becoming clear is that when we get these population level information about exoplanets, they're very diverse. And what this must mean, in turn, is that the processes that create these planets have to be similarly diverse. They have to have very diverse outcomes. And so the core of this thesis is really to go back to the planet formation environments and try to understand that and then connect that with the exoplanet populations. So we must start with the traditional star and planet formation sequence that I'm showing here. So to get a planet, you first start in your cold molecular cloud. And re over dense regions in that cloud are going to collapse under gravity. They're eventually going to form a protostar surrounded and ensconced in this envelope of material that continues to accrete on to the central protostar as it grows. Ultimately, this will clear away, and you'll end up with a rotating disk of gas, dust, and ice, which is the protoplanetary disk. So named because this is the environment in which planets are going to form. And so this is uh, obviously going to be a big focus of this thesis, because this is where we think planets form, and they uh, acquire their compositions. And then after the protoplanetary disk, once the planets have formed, the gas and dust will then be dispersed. And you'll end up with a fully formed planetary system, much like our own solar system. And so the point really is that the exoplanetary systems we see must trace their initial conditions back to this disk phase here. But not to neglect the previous stages, the planet formation and star formation process are intimately linked. And you can't ignore these earlier phases, because they're going to also imprint on the physical and chemical structure of your protoplanetary disk. And so I've just listed a few examples of how that might take place. First one is chemical inheritance, what kind of molecules you have in these earlier phases that just get incorporated into your disk. Also, in terms of bulk materials, how much gas do you have? How much dust do you have to then put into your disk? And that will set pretty stringent limits on how many and the types of planets that you can form. 
as well as the environment. You could imagine a disk that is living in a very quiescent star-forming region, or one that is sitting right next to a massive star that is getting uh, very radiated. So my thesis broke down into these two regions. And so I want to first talk about this prehistory. So just a little aside into this star formation, uh, the massive star formation that Karen had alluded to. And then I'll come back and introduce the, the disk phase. And so right now, I'm going to talk about this, this, this phase and really motivated by the question of what degree of chemical complexity uh, is going to be incorporated into the planets and how this is going to influence their compositions. OK, so an extremely brief rundown of how this works. Everything is, is quite simplified in this picture. But in those earlier phases, we do see the presence of complex molecules, so-called COMs, complex organic molecules. In space, these are uh, carbon-bearing molecules with six or more atoms. Now, this is not quite complex by terrestrial standards. But in space, this is pretty big. Um, and so what we, end seeing, what we end up seeing is that the, these COMs are forming via ice chemistry on the dust grains here. And then once you have a protostar that is luminous enough, that can produce high enough temperatures in the gas, these are going to be sublimated, and you're going to produce a population of gas phase molecules that you can observe. Simplified picture, but that's what you should have in mind where we have this gas phase, population of comms that we're actually able to observe. And so I want to introduce the first project that I work on just, just briefly. This is G10.6. It's a massive star forming region. And you might wonder why massive star forming region. Because the molecules that we see in these regions aren't directly going to be incorporated necessarily into planetary systems, uh, into disks. But I want to argue that these massive regions actually give us an ideal chemical laboratory to explore comms. Because the scales are much larger. You notice the scale bar here, this is thousands of AU. The temperatures are much hotter because you're dealing with massive stars. And the densities are much higher as well. So in this region, here I'm showing the centimeter continuum and the alma continuum. But in this region, we have a few massive protostars forming. So kinematics suggests that there's maybe 100 or 200 solar masses of material, so a few OB stars. But the most important thing that I want you to take away is if you look at spectra throughout this region, you see pretty staggering chemical complexity. Every one of these lines here is coming from a rotational transition of a molecule. And many of these molecules are complex organics. So it doesn't matter exactly what the molecules are. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, just know that these are coming from complex molecules. And we're seeing a lot of them. Implying this gas is, is very calm rich. What's nice about this is that we have so many lines, we can take all of this together and synthesize it, because many of these lines have slightly different excitation conditions. And if you put all of these lines together, what you can do is an excitation analysis across this entire region. So skipping a lot of work to get to that actual point, but here is a map of several different complex organic molecules. Again, don't worry exactly about the molecule if you're not familiar with it. The one, the point I want you to take away is the diversity that we see. So here, we're tracing the gas column densities. We're tracing the underlying density of these molecules. And the distribution spatially is quite different. You can see a molecule like uh, methanol here. It's incredibly extended across your whole region. Whereas a molecule like formamid here, it's only found in these two clumps, probably right next to the two protostars in this region. Beyond this spatial variation, we're also seeing similar variation in the total amounts of molecules. Again, if you look at methanol, Look at the abundance here and compare it to something like acetaldehyde or formamid. It's orders of magnitude different in total amount of gas. So lots of complexity that we're seeing in this region. Now this is fantastic. You can do lots of great science here. We have information about these molecules at every single pixel in this image. So you can correlate those, look for trends, explore formation, destruction mechanisms, all these molecules. But I want to bring this back to the, the disk environment. And so what's also happening is that we're having emerging evidence that some of this complex chemistry is surviving into the disk phase. So if you see here, this is uh, methanol, dimethyl ether, and methyl formate. Some of those, those are all the same molecules that we saw in G10.6. So it does appear that there is an organic reservoir for forming planets in at least some disks. But then if you recall the image from G10.6, there does appear to be a lot of variation occurring in these earlier stages to the disks. So what it most likely means is that disks are going to have calm reservoirs, but they'll be varying um, from source to source. And that variation we don't really understand quite yet. So takeaway for this, this part is really the pre-disk history is going to influence your disk conditions and thus your planets. And I argue that the massive star forming regions have a role to play going forward, because this is only the only place where we can really see calm chemistry that is very spatially resolved, where we can get really beautiful images like this. Compare that to the blobs that you're seeing in disks. This really is a spatial scale argument. This is 50 AU, and this is 
2008 yeah. So you can really do better here to get the resolved chemistry, learn some things here, and then take them and apply them to the disk environments. Okay, so now just to move on topically and focus on that last stage. And this comprised uh, uh, chapters two to six in my thesis. This is the protoplanetary disk phase. So disks are the last stage when we have substantial reservoirs of molecular gas remaining. And as such, they're really ideal environments to study the initial chemical conditions before you get to your final planetary system. And so looking at an artistic rendition like this, what you see is a flattened distribution of gas and dust. This is set by the conservation of angular momentum during the collapse, and this will evolve viscously. So this looks like a fairly simple picture if you look at this artistic rendition. But if you were to zoom in and look at a slightly more realistic version of this uh, schematic, you'd see something like this. Uh, it turns out that these disks aren't flat. They have a vertical extent to them. Uh, they have flared uh, surfaces. This is because we're maintaining hydrostatic equilibrium in these disks. There's lots and lots of small scale structure. So I just want to point out the scales that we're dealing with here. This is 1 AU to 100 AU. So at most, a few hundred AU, all of this complexity is happening, making these disks challenging to observe and understand. So what you see here is that the gas density shows gradients both vertically and radially, with the highest gas densities being here in the disk midplane. Uh, similar story in terms of gas temperature. There's a vertical and there's this radial gradients present. In terms of the dust, you have two dust populations, one of large, so-called large dust, millimeter to centimeter sized. And because it's larger, it decouples to the, from the gas, it settles vertically down to the midplane, and it drifts radially in. The small dust population is micron or submicron size, and it's much more widely spread, much better coupled with the gas. In terms of the temperature structure, what you have is a chemical stratification. You have an upper layer, the disk atmosphere, which is heavily irradiated and very hot. It almost behaves like a, a PDR. Below that, you have a warm molecular layer. And this is where we're seeing uh, warm enough temperatures, high enough gas densities that we can have a lot of gas phase molecules existing. And in fact, that's where we observe most of the molecules and disks in this warm layer. And then below that, in the midplane, you have a very cold region, where now all your molecules are frozen out onto dust grains. And to put this in context, this is where we expect planets to be forming, in this midplane here. This is where we have the highest densities and where we expect planets to form. But this overall disk structure is going to have dramatic consequences for the nascent planets in these disks at different locations throughout the disk. Uh, what is the exact solid density at the location you're forming a planet? Um, what temperature is it like? Um, and I should note also the presence of these snow lines, because it matters if your planet is forming interior or exterior to a various snow line. Snow line is when you, cr you cross the condensation temperature of a particular molecule. So as you cross these snow lines, because of the temperature gradient, molecules are going to be freezing out onto the grains. And you might think, OK, I can just worry about the midplane, then they don't have to worry about these upper layers in terms of what the planet is going to be like. But that's also not true. The disk layers communicate with one another. And just one example of that is the existence of these meridional flows, where you have a planet in your midplane, and what this can open up is flows of vertical uh, material from upper disk layers. So that means the reservoirs from which the planets can access isn't just the midplane. In some cases, it can be very high up in the disk. These planets can also drive radial flows as well. So these disks are just very dynamic, and everything is talking to every other component. So in short, we really need to understand the full disk structure to understand planet formation itself. OK, so now I want to go back to this schematic. And now I've labeled in some of the common tracers we use to look at disk structure. That is the emission lines, the scattered light, and the millimeter continua. So just want to walk through what disks look like in these common tracers. So here I'm showing the IM loop disk, one of a quite famous protoplanetary disks. It is at an inclined orientation with respect to us. And I've chose this disk for a reason, because it really highlights the fact that these disks aren't flat. So first, I just want to draw your attention to the scattered light image here. This is tracing the small dust that are in the upper disk layers. And you can see that very effectively here. The light is coming from the central star, scattering off this surface and being reflected to us. So you can very much see that this isn't just a pancake. Right, that there is a structure here. There's a vertical structure that's flared. And in fact, you can even see the dark midplane right here. If we compare that to something like the millimeter continuum, 
Um, and so I'm just mapping this onto the location we expect in the disk. So the millimeter continuum here is thermal emission from these large dust grains. And they're all residing in the midplane here. So it does look a lot more flat. So really, the small dust here is in the upper layers. And the, the millimeter continuum, the planet-forming reservoir, is in, the, is in the flat. Another thing to note is that they can actually show different morphologies. You see that there are spiral arms in the continuum. And there are a few different rings in the scattered light. So just adding to the complexity, your different dust populations can do different things. And we can compare all of this to what is going to be the focus of, of this thesis, which is the molecular line emission. This is coming from molecules, rotational transition of, of molecules that we've observed. So here's the 12, a 12 CO image. And all of this dust is confined into this inner region, in this, shown in this box here. So the molecular gas can be much more extended. Uh, I, I am loop is perhaps an extreme example for how extended the, the, the gas is here, but it's common to be two or three times larger than the dust. OK, so just an important caveat, because I'm going to be focusing on the line emission, because that's giving us access to the molecular gas content, the conditions of the gas, and just the chemistry in general. But it is important to know that all of the molecular line images I'm going to show you um, are really only tracing, uh, uh, tracing uh, small amounts of the total gas. So most of the gas, and thus most of the mass in these uh, disks, is in the form of molecular hydrogen. But unfortunately, molecular hydrogen doesn't have a permanent dipole. We can't readily observe it. So the molecules that we do observe are really trace constituents of the, the total mass. Uh, even dust, we can't really get at the total mass. It's maybe 1% or so. So just keep that in mind. That actually the most yeah, the gas reservoir, most of the mass is inaccessible to us. But we can still use molecules to get us access to the chemistry and physical conditions. Uh, just important to keep this in mind. OK. So of course, I have to introduce ALMA, because ALMA was foundational for this thesis. Uh, every paper in the thesis used ALMA. And the, really, the capabilities um, of the interferometer was what enabled all my science. So ALMA is a millimeter, submillimeter interferometer. Um, world's largest telescope. It has uh, 66 different antenna. Um, most of these are 12 meter in size. And so already, by having that many antenna, you get a huge improvement in sensitivity and just total collecting area. So that is very helpful to have that improved sensitivity. But I want to also focus, uh, what's perhaps more important, is the spatial resolution that you get. So with ALMA, with, or I guess with a traditional telescope, your angular resolution is set by this equation here. by the the wavelength that you're observing at, and by the size of your telescope. And for a single dish, this, this term on the denomin uh, denominator here is the diameter. But in the case of interferometer, that's the, the separation, the longest separation between two of your, your antennas. So in the case of ALMA, the real capability is the fact that you can pick these baselines as long as 16 kilometers. And so by being able to spread your, your, your array so far apart, you get sub arc second resolution. You can really push down that theta. And because you have so many antenna in your array, you still maintain a high sensitivity, even on these long baselines. And that really is what's going to enable a lot of uh, really exciting science. So to sort of benchmark where we've, we've come, here is an early image of the HCN gas in HD160296. This, this is a disk that I will use often. <laughs> it will keep coming back. It's, it's one of our favorite disks. But what this image here is, uh, is HCN from the submillimeter array. So the submillimeter array, in comparison to ALMA, has only eight six meter antennas with a longest baseline around 500 meters. And so what that means is that you're only getting a few arc second resolution. But as I showed earlier in the schematic, these disks are small. Even in the nearest star forming regions, they're going to be only a few arc seconds on the sky. And so what ends up happening is that we can detect a bright molecule like HCN, as you see here, but we have no spatial information. This here, this uh, ellipse, is the beam size. It's our effective spatial resolution element. So we really can't say anything about the spatial distribution of this, this molecule, but we can know it's there and we know it's bright. So what did ALMA do? So ALMA, prior to this thesis, this was the state of the art. So this is the same disk, the same molecule, um, from data from, from Jenny Bergner. And what you can now see is a order magnitude improvement. So your beam is much smaller. You can perhaps start to resolve some substructure here. There's maybe a ring here. Maybe there's another ring here. Uh, you can also see the, the power of increasing your sensitivity. 
because all of this diffuse emission out here was not present in this image. So now we can really start to resolve substructure, result, resolve um, even very diffuse emission because we're going to better angular resolution and better sensitivity. OK, so even uh, at this point, when we had data of this quality prior to my thesis, uh, there were many open questions. So the first one being, how common are substructures in this, in this gas? So we see, as I said, maybe some evidence for a ring or two here, but we don't know if this is common. We don't know if there are more hidden uh, at smaller scales. We don't know the properties of these substructures. We also don't know the chemistry occurring at small scales uh, in scales that are relevant to where we think most planets form. So I've annotated here where we think the solar system would be in this disk. And if you compare that size to the beam, we have maybe one, two beams across our uh, planet forming zone in this disk. And so we really don't know what's going on in this inner planet forming zone. And uh, the last question I'll highlight is how were the dust and the gas related, specifically on small scales? Because another big thing that was happening prior to my thesis was these beautiful images of the millimeter dust. So this is from uh, D Sharp uh, Sean's program for HD16296. And you can see, compared to the gas, this is a, a really great image of resolving substructures down to the inner uh, few a AU or so in this disk. And to drive that point home, if you compare the dust with the gas here, uh, the gas almost looks a little blurry. And so if you want to really know the relationship between these two on small scales, you quite can't do it yet with images of this quality. You can't see if there's maybe a corresponding ring at the same location. It's a little too blurry to make those kind of inferences. So for all these open questions, and many more that I'm not highlighting here, really motivated the MAPS program. And so MAPS was molecules with ALMA at planet forming scales. And as you can perhaps guess from the title, this was to move to very high resolution, resolve those inner planet forming zones in disks in many, many different molecules. And I'll, I'll make that point in a few slides how many molecules we actually were able to see. But I, I just want to introduce the program itself. It was around 100 hours with ALMA, so a, an enormous amount of data. It was led by Karn, as well as the other copies listed here, Yuri Akawa, Catherine Walls, Vivian Guzman, and Ted Bergen. It was a huge collaboration of nearly 40 astronomers, eight countries, uh, 26 institutions. And so we worked really hard, uh, put out 20 papers in September 2021. And there's been a few subsequent papers since then. So it's a lot of data. We did a lot of work here. But I think the most gratifying thing is since this has happened, since September 2021, there's been another seven papers using the MAPS data from independent teams. And this is gratifying because we spent a lot of time trying to make the data very accessible and very usable by the community. And in fact, if you want, you can go to the web page here and you can download all of it. I, I think it's 5, 10 terabytes of, of data in total. But you, you can get it. Uh, more importantly, we made smaller data products. We gave you all of the scripts to reproduce calibration, reduction, make our plots, more papers, anything you could possibly need. Um, again, big credit to Ryan Loomis. Uh, former student here, who really helped a lot in, in making this accessible and an amazing website. So that was very nice to see. Um, but OK, let's get to what we actually uh, observed. MAPS looked at five disks in detail. Each one of these five disks has some evidence of ongoing planet formation, as well as a variety of dust substructure. So here is showing the millimeter continuum. Again, this is the, the larger dust, the planet forming reservoir. And what we see is a variety of substructure. So some, like ion loop, as you've already seen, have spiral arms. Geomerige has a central cavity. AS209 has many concentric, very small dust rings. And now, if we go back to our benchmark and we place the image of HCN, same disk, same molecule, um, and compare what we've done from prior to MAPS to the MAPS quality data, we see staggering improvement. We now, in fact, see that there are four separate rings in the HCN distribution. Uh, one ring here, one ring here one here, and then there's another one. So it's a little hard to see the, the, this one. Um, we also have a small enough beam that now we're actually getting down to that inner planet forming zone, as was the goal. We're resolving the gas down to 10 AU or so. And so I just like this image, because if you just sort of scan, if you start here and you look at the SMA, and look where we end up now, this is a staggering improvement. And this is less than a decade. right? This, is, this data is from 2015, and this was from 2021. So we've come a long way in a relatively short amount of time. But 100 hours with ALMA, we didn't just look at one disk. We didn't just look at one line. So now I'll show you the full gallery or 
some of the molecules that we've observed. So here, every column is a different tracer. This is the millimeter dust in 12CO. Each row here corresponding to a different disk. So here are the five disks that were observed. And I'll just fill this in. So again, this isn't even all of the data, but this is uh, staggeringly beautiful. First, these are amazing images. Um, what we can already see by just glancing across this is a lot of striking morphological differences. Right? If you look down a column or across a row, you see variation. So even in the same line or even in the same disk, we see the many molecular faces of these disks. Now, those molecules at the top might not mean a lot to those that don't work on these regularly, so I just want to recast this in perhaps a way that's more uh, familiar. Really, the way, the way we chose these was to target key molecules that would tell us something about the physical nature or the chemical nature of these disks. So for instance, the CO isotopologues give us access to gas density. The hydrocarbon molecules are a tracer of the carbon abundance. The HCO plus ion traces ionization. The CN molecule traces the UV field. And the combination of HCN and DCN give us the D to H ratio. And that really was the motivator, to get as much information as we could about these disks. But my interest, and the first MAPS paper that I led, was really focused on these variations that we're seeing and the nature of substructures that are appearing. And so what you see here is now the five disks, again, in our same line, HCN. And what's immediately evident is that there are substructures. Those substructures are quite varied. So for IM loop, there is a central cavity with a diffuse plateau outside. G. Moriga has a very small ring in the center. IM loop has one very wide ring. IHD160296 has four rings. And MWC for its zero has a very centrally peak profile. So same line, different sources, extremely different morphologies. And not only that, if you look at the intensity, here is a radial profile of each one of these lines for each disk, kept on the same Y scale here. You can see that, that this variation extends to the intensity. Something like IM loop has very weak emission, whereas MWC480 is off the charts here, strong. So in any way you could expect these molecules and these disks to vary, they, they do. And so the big takeaway really is that planets forming in these disks are going to form in very chemically rich environments, but quite distinct environments, depending on which source they, they form in. So really, the, the big conclusion was that substructures in the lines are, are ubiquitous. And so what I did is let a systematic characterization of all the substructures that we saw in 18 of the bright lines in R5 disks. And just doing this resulted in over 200 different features. You can see an example of how we actually uh, precisely fit the radius, the width, and the depths of the features, and cataloged all of them. I think it's a five or six page table in, in the paper. Um, it ended up that we saw substructures in the form of rings, gaps, emission plateau at every radii where we detected line emission, in every type of molecule, and down to our effective resolution limit. So as far as we could see down, we could still see rings and gaps. So that raises naturally the question of what is the origin of these chemical substructures. This could be broadly categorized into two different things, chemistry or dysphysical structure. Just listed some possible uh, reasons why that might be. But you might expect having 200 different features, we couldn't actually go ahead and identify each ring and each gap being caused from a certain mechanism, nor did we attempt to. But rather, we tried to establish broad empirical connections to see if these substructures in the gas were related to dust or related to snow lines. And so I'll just walk through two of these uh, next. So what about dust? We might expect that we see uh, rings or gaps occurring in the line emission at the same location we either see a ring or gap in the dust. And so that's what we tried to assess here. And perhaps the, to, to the, the first thing, maybe the naive thing, where we just take all of our lines, um, all of our substructures, and compare them against each other, and figure out what percentage are overlapping with each other. So we took maybe the, we took 150 AU inward, so nominally the inner disk, and did this for every source. And we have four ways that things could overlap. You could have a ring and a gap in the dust, or a ring and a gap in the gas overlapping with each other. And to just to guide the eye here is about a third of features overlapping, and here is 50%. So you see in some cases, and for some disks, we do see considerable alignment. We see a few cases where this exceeds 50% of substructures in the gas and the dust being aligned. So it doesn't seem that it's universal that we're always seeing alignments, but it does, in some cases, seem to, seem to matter. 
Now, this, this story isn't over because immediately after we published this, there was a subsequent paper that said, OK, let's do this in a proper statistical way. And they found only a few of these were statistically significant, particularly MWC480. Then only maybe a month ago, another paper that actually took the MAPS data, modeled in detail the gas pressure profiles, and found the pressure bumps were aligning with the millimeter dust rings. And so just to say this is a very active, uh, uh, we, we don't have the answer, active field of study. Uh, we actually have the data to at least assess this now. So that does seem, in some cases, that we're having alignments between the dust and the gas. But open questions remain. What about snow lines? And so here I'm showing two of the disks where we take radial profiles from lots of our different lines and plot them against the locations of the snow lines, where CO and where N2 are freezing out onto the dust grains. At that location, you might expect pretty dramatic chemi chemical changes because you're taking CO or you're taking N2 out of the gas phase and putting it onto the grains. And so what we should look for is these gray and these gray and these pink lines, do they overlap with any particular feature in the radial profile? And in fact, they do, at least in these two disks. But the real problem that you'll notice is that for each snow line, we actually have two measurements. One that is shaded, which is from thermochemical models, and then one that is dashed, which is from an observational tracer. And as you'll notice, that they are not at the same place. Sometimes they, they are very far from each other, more than 10 AU. And so that really limits uh, whatever conclusions we can draw. Because for instance, in this, in this case, if you take the shaded, it's always at a ring. But if you take the dashed, it's always at a gap. So <laughs> they're probably related. But again, it doesn't seem like snow lines are necessarily a universal option. These two disks showed some degree of alignment. The other three didn't. And even in these, we need better snow line locations uh, to push this any further. So big takeaway is we see ubiquitous substructures in the gas. But the actual explanation for the substructures we see is probably complicated, probably a complex interplay of abundance, excitation, uh, temperature, and chemical variations. OK, so that was very much about the radial structure of these disks. Now I want to talk about the vertical structure. And this was an opportunity that was afforded to us from this very great MAPS data and the fact that these disks were at a favorable inclination where we can actually see the vertical structure. So as I had noted before, there is this warm molecular layer where most of the lines are coming from. So we have warm enough gas temperatures, high enough densities that we can have these gas-based molecules and observe them. And if you don't believe me, here's an observation where I can actually see that uh, mapping onto this cartoon pretty well. We're seeing 12 CO in an edge-on disk. So there is very much this confined layer where we're seeing the aligned emission from. Um, but why should we care about this vertical structure in the first place? Why does it matter where the molecules are coming from? And there are many reasons. So the first one is to understand disk uh, gas kinematics. This is a relatively new field, but incredibly powerful, and has enabled all kinds of new measurements in disks, identification of protoplanets, the measurement of stellar and disk masses, measuring turbulence, gas flows, dynamics. All of this matters to understand where the, the line is coming from. So how this, the, how this works is you have a velocity field. So your gas is rotating. You can see one side of the disk is coming towards you, another is moving away from you. And from this, you can subtract off this Keplerian rotation. And what you end up is velocity residuals, from, shown from Matt, uh, Rich Teague's MAPS paper. And you can use these residuals here to infer what's causing them. So you can measure fairly subtle deviations in the velocity and map that back on to physical changes in the disks potentially a protoplanet at certain locations. But critically, to do this mapping, you need to know where your line is coming from. You need to know the emission surface, where vertically in the disk this line is originating. Because if you don't take that into account, you'll get spurious signals when you do the subtraction. You need the most accurate subtraction here to actually believe your residuals and infer things about your disk. And here, perhaps, is a more direct example where there, in, in this field, we've been able to identify uh, velocity kinks, deviations, from the isovelocity contours where we expect the emission to come from, and therefore ascribe that to planets causing this. But if we want to ascribe this to planets, we should have a good idea of what the structure should actually look like, so be able to quantify these deviations. Beyond kinematics, uh, this actually offers us a chance to measure 2D gas temperatures, which I'll talk about a bit later, as well as has implications for the chemistry. Because if we're measuring things from upper disk layers, we need to be able to connect that to the midplane where planets are actually warming. OK, so I just want to walk through a little bit how this actually works. So if you have data that is in the, all data from ALMA interferometers in the form of these uh, channel maps or image cubes, where you can see that at various velocities here, 
different distributions of emission. And because the gas in these disks is rotating in the Keplerian fashion, what you can see is this very characteristic butterfly pattern. And if you look at this long enough, you can associate it with the physical structure of your disk. So the part of the disk that's coming towards us, the blue shifted, uh, as you move through the velocities, you eventually see the part that's moving away from you. And because these disks aren't two-dimensional, they have these surfaces here where the emission is coming from. That's why you get this shape. So to just drive the point home, if we uh, judiciously choose a particular channel, we can actually see the vertical structure from where the lines are originating from directly. And so here I've labeled this emission, upper emission surface and the lower emission surface here and the dark midplane in the middle. And so this is all shown for, for 12 CO here. So the fact that we can actually see this because we have very high angular resolution data means that we can just directly read off and measure where this height is coming from in the disk. And so how this works is something like this. So for, again, to show the channel, we can see the front and the back side. And so we measure at each radius a particular height of where that line is coming from. And we see this very characteristic emission surface that steeply rises, plateaus, and turns over because at large radii, your gas surface density is going down. And we can play the same game for the isotopologs, so for 13 CO. And what you notice here is that the emission surface is lower. And this is because what we're effectively tracing is a tau equals one surface. And so it takes longer to build up to tau equals one if you go to a rarer or a less abundant isotopologue. And that's reflected in the channel maps where the two lines move closer together, indicating they're coming from deeper in the disk. And we can do the same thing for, uh, for uh, C18O. Again, now you're down pretty much at the, the midplane. And so what you've now done is assembled the full 2D structure of your disk. And if you can put these all together to get something like this. And you'll notice now that each point here is colored um, by the gas temperature. Because at each point along here, you can measure the peak intensity of your line. And if you assume the line is optically thick, now you have a measurement of the local gas temperature. And so in this way, you've mapped out both the 2D structure of the line emission, but also the 2D temperature structure. And this is incredibly powerful because it's entirely empirical. You're just grabbing this from your channel maps, and the assumption you're making is just optically thick lines. So in fact, we were able to do this for all five map sources. Very powerful to check models and to inform models, and just to get an idea of what the temperature actually is in the midplane, which is quite hard to do because we can extrapolate from these down to where planets are actually forming. OK, so now I want to focus a little bit on the 12 CO. And so what we saw in maps was that the 12 CO emission surfaces showed a range of heights. So again, I'm showing the height as a function of radius here. And for some of the sources, I am Luke, GM Rege, we saw in terms of an aspect ratio, Z over R, we saw 0.4. That's, where, that's how high the emission surface was coming from. But in other sources, we saw only around 0.2. And the remaining disks were somewhere in the middle. So we're seeing this uh, range here, that the 12 CO, the same line, is coming from a range of heights, from 0.2 to 0.4. And so the question then we had was, what actually is setting the height of these emission surfaces? First, is there any characteristic height? Will disks always be between 0.2 and 0.4? Or are we just sampling uh, a bias sample with only five MAPS disks? Also, how does this height vary with stellar or disk parameters, if at all? So, plotted them versus stellar mass, the heights, and versus the size of the, the disk in 12 CO. Now, five points doesn't make a correlation. It barely makes a trend. So a heavy em emphasis on this question mark. And so what that really means is we need more sources. And so that's what I spent the, the next uh, few papers or chapters of my thesis doing was assembling a much wider sample. And so here's the very quick, uh, there's a lot of work to assemble all of these, but here's all of them together showing a three-dimensional representation of 12 CO surfaces and a much wider uh, sample of disks where the colors here are indicating the height. So as you move to the lighter colors, you're higher up in your emission surface. And by doing this, going into the ALMA archive, which just had data sitting there, we developed all these great techniques to get the vertical heights from maps, and we could just readily apply them on the archival data and get this much larger sample to explore what sets the vertical structure. I want to highlight that this is uh, some work done with uh, Sage Christen. He was an amazing Harvard undergraduate student that really helped um, push some of the early exploration of, of showing that we can actually do this for archival data. OK, so now get back to answer those questions. What about characteristic value? 
Uh, no, there doesn't seem to be a characteristic value. <laughs> As you can see, z over r goes from anywhere maybe 0.15 to now above 5. So there's even more diversity than was suggested by the map sources. What about the trends that we were seeing? So if we compare the heights uh, in this sample versus the stellar mass, what we see is maybe a decreasing trend if you make some reasonable scaling assumptions that the height is scaling with the gas pressure scale height, uh, you get a fairly weak power law. So that's sort of the problem. We see lots of scatter, but the power law you get is weak. So it's broadly consistent with this. But there are certainly outliers, like this disk here. Um, what we did see and did were able to confirm is that the, as you move to larger disks, as measured by their 12 CR radius, you do see a pretty strong trend that holds up in this larger sample. And in fact, we're able to have a, a prescription for this. So say you have a disk that's face on, you know its size, but you need to know where the 12, C, uh, 12 CO is coming from. You could use this relationship here. Um, and this generally is going in the right direction. I just plotted a uh, scaling raw that you'd expect for maybe a self-gravitating disk. These probably aren't self-gravitating, but it's sort of going in the right direction. As you get bigger um, disks, you expect higher surfaces. So take away from all this, CO emission surfaces in disks are coming from elevated layers, but those layers are there's a lot of diversity there. They're not coming necessarily from the same height. If we use CO isotopologues, we can actually map out the full 2D disk structure and measure the temperatures empirically across the height of the disk. OK, and so now coming to my last, uh, last and perhaps the, 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 some of the most exciting things that are happening now. And this is actually talking about signatures of embedded planets. And so if we put a planet in the disk, we expect that the process of forming that planet is in turn going to affect the chemical and physical structure of the disk. These aren't isolated processes. And in fact, this is what was predicted from models. So here's a model by Ilsa Cleves, where she shows that if you add a Jupiter mass planet in a disk, you get local heating. So things are heating up uh, around the planet. You can pick it out as muthally. So what this should mean is that we should be able to see detectable chemical asymmetries in these disks, where we have giant planets forming. And there is some evidence that that has been seen. So in this, in this disk HD10056, on a paper from Alice Booth, she's able to show that there is CO emission right at the location where there is a giant planet candidate. And moreover, she was able to show that over a baseline of eight and a half years, the spectra of the CO changed. So you can see this prominent change right here. And this baseline, eight and a half years, is comparable to about a fifth of the orbit of a planet at 10 AU, which is where this, this planet is. So this really builds the story that maybe we're actually seeing a chemical asymmetry tracing a planet. So that brings me to the disk that I want to focus on, which is HD169142. It's a face-on disk around a Herbig star that has been thought to have a giant planet. Um, so anywhere from one to five Jupiter masses at 40 AU, right there. That is where the, the planet has been suspected to be. And this has been inferred from a variety of, of, of evidence. So there is uh, gas depletion uh, here in this ring. There's also a gap in the millimeter dust. So this is consistent with having a giant planet sweeping up material both in gas and dust. Now, we actually know there is something there. So very recently, uh, less than a month ago, this paper came out by Ian Hammond, which actually showed that there is a Keplerian rotating blob in the near infrared, which they uh, claim is a recently confirmed planet, the HD169142 b. And it does move as you'd expect. It creates an outer spiral wake. And combining this with the previous uh, information, it does really seem like there is a, a giant planet in this disk. Now, concurrently to this, uh, before I knew about the, the, that paper I just showed you, I was working on archival data for this source. And we found some nice 12, 13 CO images, uh, nothing necessarily out of the order. but Serendipitously, we found the detection of bright SO in this disk, the only the fifth such detection. But more excitingly, we detected SIS in this disk. So this molecule has never been seen in a disk environment before. And it's very asymmetric. As you can see here, this disk, very, you know, 13 CO, very circular, just seeing in this arc here in SIS. And what's more exciting is if you plot this uh, against the planet location, the SIS arc is right along where the planet is, and there's a blob of SO right where the planet is. So that's exciting. We take a spectra, look at that location for maybe something else, and we do find something else. So we find an additional peak in the 13CO, which is not Keplerian, and is showing up right here, right at the location where the planet is. 
And in fact, we see a similar signature in the 12 CO2. So we have a bunch of lines all appearing right at the location where the giant planet is thought to be. And so this is pretty compelling. Um, what is causing this? So we know that SO and SIS are shock tracers. I mean, you need to get SI from the dust grains into the gas to form SIS. So this puts um, some limits on, on, on how big this planet is and has to be carving pretty big shocks here to see this big tail of SIS. You're going to have to be liberating SI from the dust grains. Overall, we speculate this is probably a planet-driven outflow. It's probably we're not actually seeing the circumplanetary material, but we're seeing the interaction of the planet with the gas, um, which is generally consistent with the kinematics and the spatial offsets we see. Certainly, we need to follow this up. This is a, a great target for ALMA follow-up. So the takeaway, this disk really shows compelling multi-molecule, multi-line evidence of chemical isometries, the first time that has been seen. And it perhaps offers us some molecular targets, SO, SIS, to go search for other disks, to give us an independent way to go confirm the existence of giant planets in these disks. OK, very last few minutes, just want to end with a few outlooks uh, and what I think the next steps are. So I think we need to move beyond the map sources. So the map sources are fantastic, bright, beautiful, and we've learned a huge amount of spatially resolved chemistry. But if you compare those to what are typical disks, the vast majority of disks, probably also where the vast majority of planets form, this is what you see. This is maps. This is a typical disk. Same spatial scales. This is the gas, and this is a typical disk. So vastly different environments. It's unclear if we can extrapolate things learned here to things like this. So this is going to require some commitment with ALMA, because these are much smaller. You need to spend more time. You would like to have them spatially resolved, but that's going to be a, a challenge. So um, I think that is a way we need to go. There is an ongoing uh, large program led by uh, ILSA to expand the number of, of disks we have, but we still need to really push in terms of spatial resolution on these smaller disks. And we can really move beyond the CO lines that I was showing you in terms of vertical structure. And in fact, we tried a little bit in maps, where we were able to map out where the C2H and the HCM lines were coming from in a disk. But the method to do this is entirely agnostic. We can do this for any lines, as long as we have good enough data. And in fact, uh, Teresa has shown that this is possible, for even for just the maps data. If you just really push the methods and try to extract heights of multiple different lines, the main point I want you to take away is look at all the different colors here. Each one's a different molecule tracing out the full disk structure. And so I think it's a bright future with better data quality, we can see the full chemical structure in a two-dimensional way. And in the, just within the last two years, we've detected all kinds of new molecules. So I mean, methanol is not new, but here's some two new detections. It's hard to detect in disks. Here are three of the five SO detections. First detection of SO2, first detection of NO, first detection of methyl formate, along with a few others. So just rapidly, we're entering this era where we're still detecting new molecules. We're still exploring what kind of chemistry is in these disks. And I think this has a really bright future, uh, in part because ALMA is going to be upgraded soon. ALMA 2030 is going to have a wideband sensitivity update. The point I want you to take away is we're currently with the blue bars. This is the improvement. So multiple uh, 30, 40, 50 times better bandwidth, so a much larger spectral grasp. And so for free, you'll be detecting all kinds of molecules you never imagined before. And very last uh, thing to say is I didn't mention this at all in the talk, but JWST is out there observing disks and going to probe the innermost regions of these disks, things we can't really get at with ALMA in the inner 1 to 5 AU. And so this really gives us an opportunity to connect the outer disk chemistry we see with ALMA with the inner disk chemistry we see with JWST. And it's still early days in terms of the science that's coming back, but it's already clear that at least a few disks show pretty complex chemistry. These are big hydrocarbon molecules, C6H6, C4H2. So really, by combining ALMA and JWST in the future, we'll be able to learn a lot more. OK, with that, I'll just say the takeaway is next decade and beyond really promises to continue to transform our view of planet formation. OK, with that, I'll leave out my summary and happy to take any questions.
uh, sort of vertical mapping. I have a question that's going to be nitty gritty DLBI, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> but my understanding is that you're essentially interpreting the brightness temperature of various CO isotopologues, uh, right? And so going from that to a, a temperature distribution, doesn't that depend on, because uh, looking at these images, these look like these are all, you know, uh, beam convolved clean components that are sort of speckly. Doesn't that depend a little bit on your beam weighting choices? And, and could you get a one or, or, or sort of factor of two swing if you weight differently? Yes, probably not a factor of two. Um, <laughs> But yes, it will, it will depend on your, on your beam size. It will depend on if you're, um, yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes, it will depend. Uh, it, probably not at the level of a factor of two um, for, for these. <laughs> but I mean, if you could ultimately, say, do similar analysis in the UV, um, maybe that would give you some advantage as well. Not that I'm currently exploring that. It's, so far, everything is image plane for this. simple question. I don't think I <clears throat> excuse me, heard the word inclination in your talk. That's a very <clears throat> hard to derive parameter in the binary world, which I'm more used to thinking about. <clears throat> but why doesn't it matter here? So it definitely does matter. I didn't, I didn't dwell a bit on inclination, because we actually know the position angle inclination of these systems almost perfectly. Um, we can measure it from the, the continuum images, and so we can fit it also simultaneously with any of the analysis that we do. So we can actually really well constrain the geometric parameters of our sources. And in fact, we do need that for all this, this analysis. It depends sensitively on that. And in fact, all the vertical structure that I was talking about really relies on the fact that these disks are inclined, right? Because if they're face on, you don't see anything. If they're edge on, you don't see the, ra the radial aspect. So inclination, very important. Any additional questions? Um, this was a great talk. In the like, grid of images that you have, the one that's in the top left example right here, you have the various columns with molecules, some molecules were, there's some columns, um, some molecules that had one column, some molecules that had two, and then some of the um, columns where you're looking at the same molecule and have slightly different structure. So what are you learning from here? Yeah, so that good, good observation. Um, that's because the, the program was targeted to have uh, a few different rotational transitions of the same molecules. So for instance, for the CO isotopologues, we were able to observe the J equals 2 to 1 and the 1 to 0. And what's important about that is they have different excitation conditions. And so the fact that you can use the detection of both of those molecules, those rotational transitions simultaneously to constrain things like the temperature or the density of your molecules, uh, which is very powerful and was by design. So there are some molecules that have many uh, detections of different rotational lines. Like methyl cyanide, for instance, has a very helpful K ladder, which gives you access to the temperature. So that is that is that was by design. Thank you. I'm curious about the stellar or protostellar hosts of some of these systems, right? So you mentioned that some of the uh, like these these example ones you do, they're much larger uh, protoplanetary disks. Is that also because their host star is like a proto massive star, or is it? Do, what do we know about the, the stellar host? That's, that's a good question. Uh, no, they're, these are spanning a range of anywhere from 0.4 to two, uh, <laughs> two or three solar masses. So they're not necessarily um, going to be you know, these massive stars. And in fact, it's not actually clear the massive star formation channel if disks, how, to what degree disks are even involved in, in terms of, of building up your mass. Um, so we just basically targeted the things that are bright, that are the outliers in the distribution. So if you do disk surveys, which ones have the largest radius in the continuum, which has the largest radius in the 12 CO, which are known to have molecules from previous surveys. So in that sense, we are really just sampling the biased end of the large disks. There are many, many small disks, and that's where we need to go next, actually, is to the typical source. These ones just happen to end up with lots of material through whatever was happening during the star formation process. Okay, so there doesn't seem to be a correlation in terms of the what stellar mass versus like the, the mass of the core, core planetary disk around it or well that's the mass is hard <laughs> um, <laughs> actual mass is hard it's a whole another issue that we actually don't uh, really know the masses for these I mean they probably correlate in some in some degree um, it'd be great if we could have tagged all these with masses and we could have a whole new space of correlation but uh, we don't I don't see any more raised hands. So I think that means that the public portion of the defense is coming to an end. Uh, we are going to have a private uh, defense. The, the private portion is this afternoon. 
and you know, dependent on how that goes. Um, there may or may not be an opportunity to come and celebrate down in the lobby around 3.30 or so, so be on the lookout for an email, or maybe just like, I don't know, make your way in that direction, <laughs> hoping for the best. Um, but with that, uh, thank you, this was great job.